Hi, everyone. My name is Lan. Uh, I'm a committer in Eclipse OpenJNI and adopt OpenJDK. And I just learned one sentence in Bulgarian. Kakste? <laughs> I hope I pronounced it right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm Shelly, and I'm a, I have the same credentials as Lan. I'm an Eclipse OpenJ9 committer and, and a committer at Adopt OpenJDK, and I also serve on the technical steering committee at Adopt OpenJDK. Who here has heard of Adopt OpenJDK? Some people. Who here has heard of OpenJDK? Okay, a lot of people, good. Because we're going to talk today about testing OpenJDK implementations in the open. Uh, but I'm going to hand it over to Lan to start everything off. She told you the Bulgarian word uh, phrase that she learned. <sighs> this isn't a political statement here, but I'm going to tell you the Bulgarian word that I learned yesterday. I think it's pronounced rakia. 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 <laughs> <laughs> So this is my body protesting <laughs> on the amount that I consumed. <laughs> but anyway, so if you see me take a knee, <laughs> it's just to deal, to deal with that. <laughs> sure. Uh, before we actually dive into any details, I just want to do a quick survey. Uh, how many notifications do you guys get on the phone in one day? Anyone? 20? <laughs> 100? <laughs> A lot, right? <laughs> so yeah, nowadays we really get a lot of data. Like we as a human being become the data processing center almost. We, we filter out the data that's unrelated to us and we deal with the data that's important to us. This is no different in a testing world. Uh, the more and more tests we add, uh, the more data we have to deal with. And in today's talk, uh, Shelly and I will just uh, talk about how we deal with our data overload. So we start with some background information so you guys understand our challenges, and then we're going to talk about our test framework called TestKit Gen, which will actually help us to uh, not only run tests simply, but also provide a common look and feel and allow us to uh, get a summary. And uh, we're going to talk about our um, automation build and um, followed by the test result summary service, which will further help us to triage the data. Uh, we don't want to stop there. Uh, we want to look at the deep learning technology and see if we can leverage that. And uh, well, we actually did a lot of uh, data refinery experiments, which we will talk about later. Uh, the last but not least, we will talk about the, the plan moving forward. So, who we are? Uh, so, where a group of people try to uh, ensure free Java for the community and actually verify Java for the community as well. So, we work, uh, we're working for three open source projects Eclipse OMR, Eclipse uh, OpenJNI, and Adopt OpenJDK. We actually manage six plus Jenkins. Believe it or not. <laughs> uh, just in case you don't know what Jenkins is, it's actually an open source automation tool which will help to automate a software development process uh, with e continuous integration. Um, so, quick question. Where do you guys get your JDK from? <laughs> Anyone? Open JDK? Open JDK, yeah. So, we actually bring another option to the table. So, you actually can get pre-built OpenJDK binaries uh, for free from different vendors. Oops, let me go back. Uh, we actually, I just checked the number right before this uh, presentation. We actually hit 34 million downloads right now. So we want well, that quiz pressure pressure on us, so we really have to make sure those people are happy with the quality of the JDK that they're downloading. So just a quick diagram to show what we're testing. So we're testing on different JDK implementations. So we have OpenJ9, Hotspot, SAP, Cradle, RI, and on different platform with different JDK versions plus different test categories. So OpenJDK regression, functional performance uh, system external. 
Now, what do I mean by data overload? Let's get some concrete numbers. So with, we all know different JDK implementation runs on different platforms. So uh, we test OpenJDK on 14 different platforms and 22 for Hotspot, one at this point for SAP, and three for Credo. So if you sum it up, it actually is 58 in power platform. And then we are running on six versions and with 250,000 of unique tests. And then you multiply those numbers. Anyone get the number? <laughs> Quickly. <laughs> 87 million tests. OK, great. Great number. So what? <laughs> well, that's, what does it even mean? So uh, if you translate in this into actual size, is 58 impulse platform times two groups, 70 uh, extended times uh, three test group, six versions. If each build is around 10 Mac, that's 20 gig of data per nightly build. And that's not it. I'm not even counting we're doing pull <laughs> request build, promotion build, which is actually running every 15 minutes if there's a change, and personal build. And those? are running on multiple Jenkins as well. So <laughs> when we say we have a data overload, we really do. <laughs> so <laughs> how we deal with this? This is um, just a breakdown numbers of uh, different H test category. Actually, Shelly has a pending changes on the perf test. So we are actively working on adding more and more tests. Yeah, these numbers are always growing. <laughs> So this is another view, say different tests have a different framework, right? So where they're running, some of them are running a test NG, some of them are running J units, some of them are STF, some of them are J units, or like if you look at the performance test, they're running different benchmarks. So great, that creates another challenge. They're all running with different command, and they, they all produce different output, right? And uh, most importantly, there's no summary. So you run them, you have no clue in the summary kind of how much passed, how much failed. On top of that, we have to assure the quality. So uh, in today's Java testing world, uh, OpenGTK regression is open. Great, that's a perfect starting point. But the compliance test is closed, so you need a special license for it. Uh, when we talk about the application testing, well, that's kind of unknown. We really have to trust the vendor's cl claim, so we, we don't know what's going on there. This is not a good story for open source testing. We want a world that's open and transparent. So think about a world where you know what vulnerability test passed or failed uh, against your JDK. You actually can look at the test material of uh, and add more or modify, even delete tests. And you can look at the published matrix uh, for the performance testing. And then you can look at the load and stress testing results. Is that awesome? <laughs> we think so. <laughs> <laughs> so here's our manifesto. So open and transparent. Not only the test source is open, but th the whole execution process is open. And the test result is publicly available to everyone. We want the test to be diversified and robust, meaning that functional tests, uh, different categories, so functional system, regression, um, stress, performance, you name it. And we want it to be robust. You can run against different JDK version, different JDK impulse, different platforms. And we want to evolve alongside with the implementations. So we want to uh, always refine our automation tools and reduce any friction and reduce the extra process. We want to make sure the whole thing is running simple and easy. Uh, and the test is not always the more the merrier, right? So we want to always evaluate the value of the test by looking at the matrix, like code coverage, heat map and bug prediction, and there's more. Uh, we want to do the comparative analysis, so if the test failed in one platform, does it fail on other platform? 
does it fail on other JDK implementation? What about other JDK, uh, JDK versions? We want tests to be portable, meaning you can run it locally or any other build system. Most last but not least, we want it to be able to tag the test material uh, so you know the shards, you can reproduce it anytime you want. So we really need a reactive system that works well in this changing world. We want uh, this can work for different test framework, and we want this to be flexible to fulfill different test requirements. And we want this to have a common way of adding, executing, ex uh, excluding tests. And we want standard look and feel. So it will help us to charge the data later on. And we always want it to be simple so we can run anywhere, locally or any build system. Not only that, we want the ability to be able to slice and dice. What I mean by that, you want to run <laughs> a test case or a group of tests, right? Functional op a system, OpenJDK, performance, external. You want to run on uh, different levels, uh, sanity extended special, different versions, uh, will release every six months, so here, 8, 11, 12, and so on different JDK versions, different iterations. That's really important to repeat some, uh, to actually debug uh, for some intermittent failures. And different features like AOT or JDK service, and with or without native test image. So based on that, we consolidated, and we created a test framework called TestKitGen. Uh, it actually creates a, a simple way of running any type of test. So if you do like simple make command, make uh, functional, it will just run all the functional tests, run make open JDK, it will run all the make open JDK tests and so on. Not only that, it actually creates a common look and feel and uh, it provides the test summary for us, which we will see later in the demo. So this is just a quick view of what the user need to provide. Test source and build XML actually compiles the test material and a playlist.xml. Uh, in the playlist.xml, we specify the test name, the variations, uh, which is the JVM option. You can provide zero or many. So if you provide many, we're just going to keep running the test with different combinations. And um, platform requirement, because certain tests only runs on certain platform. And command, um, what this test we're running against a different JDK impulse, different JDK versions, and you can tag the test with level and groups so that we can dice and slice later. So here is an example how we actually do uh, the dice and slice. So you can run make open JDK test, great, big, that's the, whole, that's the whole set of open JDK. If that's too big for you, like sometimes people are doing debugging, uh, they want to narrow it down. They want, don't want to waste like hours on running tests. Okay, fine. You do on the level, so you can do sanity, extended, special, dot open JDK. If that's still too big set for you, narrow it down. You can run a test in the playlist. So in here we have an example of um, you can run make JDK test. And if that's still too big for you, you can still narrow it down by running a specific test providing the path. So we talked about TestKitGen, which is a test framework that we have, allows you to run. It's barely a framework. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted it to be a thin veneer, because we don't want to be in the, the business of making more frameworks. We want to reduce. But yeah, right, <laughs> as yeah. thin a veneer as possible. It's, it is. <laughs> Actually, we're going to have a, a demo later on to yeah. show you guys. Um, so. Because we have that, and now we're going to talk about, because we cannot just run the test manually. You cannot just, you know, it will be a really boring job to have someone just keep running it on the machine. And we have the automation build. So here is basically a flow of how the adopt open JDK continuous creation pipeline looks like. So you have a build that compiles JDK. Great. Once that pass, it triggers the test. So all the tests, open JDK, uh, functional system, performance, external. They are running in parallel. If they pass, they should trigger the deploy. 
if the build fail, it shouldn't trigger the test. If the test fail, it shouldn't trigger the deploy. Um, so all this, so this is, um, I didn't write platform here, but if you really think about it, it's like tree structure. So you have the top level root that triggers the build, and then, and then it triggers for each platform, that, and then compiles the SDK, and once that's done, it triggers all the tests for each platform. So it's really a tree structure. And we have a lot of test build, right? And it's all available at adopt OpenJDK, OpenJDK test. And those build, then the nightly, the release, the pull request, performance, personal grinder, all using one Jenkins bar. That's it. The rest, it's just metadata. And we talk about the test kit. If you use the test kit gen, you can run it locally. And if you have your own Jenkins, you point to this, you can run the build as well. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, we mentioned that because I think what uh, the other thing about what we're trying to accomplish, I don't know if anyone in here uh, thinks that this is too ambitious of a plan, <laughs> but we actually think it's quite possible. We want to support OpenJDK and OpenJ9 developers so that they can run this stuff locally on their laptops. And we want to support any implementers or vendors that want to pick this up and run it in their labs. And we want to support our own projects automated CI pipeline. So we are able to do that. We know that people are running these in their own labs now. We know that developers are running them on their laptops. Um, we also know there's a lot more ways we can refine this and make it better and find volunteers from the audience to come and help us at the open projects. Um, but, but just to give you the sense of the scope of all of this and, and how we're going to now proceed into dealing with the fact that we have uh, 87 million tests per Jenkins server times a bunch of Jenkins servers. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do now? <laughs> right. So here is a screenshot that's in Adopt OpenJDK Jenkins. Again, this is public available. You guys can go ahead and uh, go into the page and take a look. We will only take a screenshot for the OpenJDK test, but you can see there's other tests that are running in there. So we purposely categorize the test build based on different uh, JDK versions, JDK impulse, and um, test category and platform, so that it's fairly easy. If there's anything failed, you can quickly spot and know what's going on. So we also leverage uh, the third-party Jenkins plugin to provide us the standardized output. Uh, on your left-hand side is the tab result uh, uh, from the tab plugin. So the, the test kit gen actually generate a tab result, and it can be consumed by this plugin. So we'll actually show you this pretty output. So green means pass, red means fail, yellow means skip. Uh, um, your right-hand side is actually the JUnit output. Um, so if the test running testng or JUnit actually generates some metadata, which can be consumed by the JUnit plugin. But because of not all the tests that are using JUnit, that's why we also have the tab result for people to look at. So uh, we archive the failed test result onto Jenkins master and uh, Artifactory servers based on the user's choice. Uh, Artifactory server is another open source project which uh, is great for the binary. It's actually a binary repository. So it's great to store the test output or any core files and any metadata files that are generated by the tab or the JUnit. So before I hand over to Shelly to talk about the test result summary service, I want to do a quick demo just to show uh, how TestKitGen works and uh, some of the grander features. Okay. So this is pre-recorded. So we actually go to, uh, to run it locally, just go to adopt OpenJDK, adopt OpenJDK, uh, OpenJDK test, and then you just get clone it. So hopefully it's not too small for you guys to see. 
So all you need to do is export test JDK home, which point to which are, whichever JDK that you want to test. And then, uh, you, and then you can use get.sh to uh, download the test kit gen and some functional test. Um, in this example, we actually export uh, build list to be equal to functional, but you can set to system performance open JDK. Depends on what you want to run, and then you can run make dash f run config to generate make files, and then make compile to compile all the test material. Um, that's it. You're ready to run. You can now uh, slice and dice uh, whatever you want. Uh, by the way, if you want to look at the combinations, what you should use, you can just go to the Git repo we have, README. So it will tell you what you sh should run. Uh, so in this example, we're running sanity.functional.regular. Uh, we we'll fast forward this because that would take quite long. <laughs> so now you'll be able to see, uh, I'm going to pause this. So you can be able to see that the total executed, the past, failed, uh, disabled, it skipped. And clearly, the shared cache test failed. And uh, also, uh, any of the test target that you can just do make and run with the target as well. So we have kind of summary what paths have failed. Uh, but if just being lazy, you can just run make failed. It will rerun your failed test. Uh, if you do disabled before your target, it will run all the disabled tests for you. So then you don't need to actually change the repo, right? You can just quickly verify, hey, did any of the tests actually get fixed? So you can just quickly, this is just a quick, easy way of running it. Uh, so if you just want to list all the disabled tests, you guys can just echo, put echo in front of disabled, and that will just print out um, the reason why this test is being executed. Uh, uh, excluded. And now we can run a specific test. Um, so any test target that matches in the playlist, you can run it. Uh, so with n score one and n score two, meaning different variations. So if you so the different variation that is specified in the playlist of XML. So in this case, we're going to try with floater sanity n score two. Just a quick example. Um, you can CD into any subfolders. That's really useful for the developer. Let's say I'm a JIT developer. I only care about JIT testing, or my change only affect uh, JIT part. So I can CD into JIT test, and I can run the same set of group as well. But in this case, it will only execute the test that matches with the group. So let's switch to the Jenkins build. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the grinders, but you can just quickly uh, take a look, we're actually running OpenJDK performance and system test on the Jenkins. So uh, there's test underscore grinder. That, that's the folder that I, we actually have a grinder in, in there. And uh, so there's a tab result history if you can look at. Um, we usually have a lot of people running grinders during the day. Um, so if you click on the build with parameters option, it actually allows you to provide your own adopt OpenJDK repo, branch OpenJDK repo, branch uh, your platform, JDK version, JDK impo. Um, just for the demo, we narrow it down to the JIT test so you can see it's faster. So you don't really need to compile the whole set. You're just doing the subset. Uh, you can specify the target. And then for the source, you can do nightly, which means it will actually get Kong adopt OpenJDK nightly build for you. Uh, you can specify the iterations to be any numbers you want. Um, label meaning that you can specify uh, on different machine if you put the machine name there or uh, a group of tags that actually matches a, a group of machine. In this case, we're just running on a specific machine. If that machine is not available, you, Basically, we're just going to wait until the machine is freed up. So here is the build that actually got triggered. So if you look at the console output, it actually gives you a, it should look like exactly the same as what we run locally. It would do the git clone, it would do the git compile, 
and running the test. It should be exactly the same. So this is really good for the developer. Let's say I only have Mac, and I want to verify on AX, or I want to verify on Linux PPE, so uh, PPC, sorry. And then that's it running on different platform using the grinder. So you also have the tab test result, so just quick view here, and it shows you the re result. If it's failed, it's going to be red, and then we'll actually show you the detailed output of what went wrong. So that's the quick view of the grinder. Now I'm going to switch back to the slides and hand over to you, Shannon. All right. Thanks, Lan. OK, so we talked about um, essentially now we're in this mess of we have all of these tests uh, where we're trying to actually verify that you, as a Java developer, have downloaded a quality binary. Um, we also want to make our jobs easier because we're a small team. So we want to make tools that help us triage. We want to make tools that help you select the which vendor you may want to choose from. So we're going to show you a little bit about this test result summary service. It's also an open project. You can go check it out. Uh, you can go use it. I think yesterday at the end of um, the performance talk, at the end of the day, someone had asked the question, is there an open source tool where I can go and have it monitor Jenkins build and look at the performance output and show it graphically? Well, you could go pick this up and use that uh, for whatever you want to run performance tests against. We actually have a team using it for a uh, performance test for Python, and we have someone also going to use it for Node.js. So the idea here is that it's a tool that can monitor multiple Jenkins servers, and then you can write a parser and plunk it in for whatever type of output you want. Um, and we, even though this is a work in progress, the, uh, we're just throwing things up there as we're making them. Um, we also have an instance running at the project. At any given time, it may be up or down, depending on what's being served up or updated on it. But we want to make sure that it can continue running as we make changes. So the quick overview really is that it uh, allows us to look at a whole bunch of different Jenkins servers. Um, the back end is kind of multi-threaded, or that's the plan. Anyway, uh, the front end then lets clients connect. The important piece for me in this story is actually uh, the database. So if you're running large projects, large Java projects, like was mentioned, I guess 400,000 lines of code was considered large there. We have millions of lines of test code that we're running. Um, we're not keeping a whole long history in our Jenkins server. It's just not possible. So we're plunking a stripped out version of the output into MongoDB. Um, it's very important for us to have history, especially for performance tests. Uh, but it's also important in terms of trying to find uh, tests that only fail once every thousand runs, or like we can't actually go back in time on the history of a Jenkins server to find the last time. <clears throat> so the dashboard of this actually looks kind of like this. And one of the ways we're dealing with the data overload is letting people have their own personalized view. So that's custom to your browser. If you don't care about any of the stuff that's running on AIX or any of the JDK 8 stuff, you can remove it from your list. And that'll stay every time you go and load the server until you set reset and everything else comes back and shows up. You can also get rid of any of the Jenkins servers that are in the list for, for being pointed at and monitored. So depending on how your team is structured, someone might be only paying attention to the, the custom server that's running certain tests, and so someone may be paying attention to something else. So you can just remove that from your view completely. Uh, for this view, th what we wanted to be able to do, another way we're handling all this data is just aggregating all the results. So we talked about those test targets and the granularity. Uh, the test targets themselves, depending on what they are, if they're in the external group, that might be the entire Scala functional suite that we're running. So external tests in our world are application large Java applications 
and we take and run their functional tests. So we've got, I, I forget how many now, plus all of the micro-profile TCKs that are running as targets in those. So within each target that's listed here, and the example, though you may not be able to see it, that we're pointing at there is 600, uh, 721 targets. Um, each one of those could contain thousands and thousands of tests. So this is just an aggregate view. Actually, what I really care about, I don't care about what passed, to, to be frank. I mostly care about what failed from this view, so I can click through into that. This is just another uh, closer view of seeing it, uh, also using some colors, probably no good for colorblind folks, but uh, you've got the numbers there to tell you, okay, we have a failure or not. It, this link over here lets you get back to the Jenkins server or either using the Blue Ocean plugin or not. So you can get right back to that, find it in your Jenkins server. Um, but what I wanted to do then is drill down in our tool to take a look at the targets. And the interesting part here is that for us, we're able to take a look at a target. Uh-oh, I see the RMI test target is failing. And in fact, the first instance of it, underscore zero, the one that's running a certain set of JDK options. Um, and it's failing on a particular platform, or, and it just started failing. So what I want to see now is, oh, all platforms, is it failing anywhere else? In this case, no. So that's going to help direct me in terms of where I need to go to triage this. If I had clicked here, all platforms, and then suddenly I saw that it was all starting to fail, it would direct me in a different way to triage these tests. And in fact, we don't show it, but you can see the history across platforms. So it's a, a kind of a different views on the data for us. The other thing that this lets you do, and maybe this isn't the best example, it lets you plunk any string into this search bar and it's gonna search all of the test results, every piece that we store in that database. Uh, so in this case, it's just looking for a test name, but actually it might be interesting to say, look for an, a particular exception or a particular name of a dump file or a core file or something. So it's gonna find uh, information like that for us quickly and bring it up. Uh, so when we talk to developers and we want to support them in their ability to move quickly, add new features, test, retest, experiment, innovate, what tool do they use most to find problems? It often goes, comes down to kind of like the very basic tools. Nothing helps you better than a quick diff of the thing. Um, we want to, of course, make it easier for you to grab and plunk down different builds, but you could say, I want to go back to a month ago where this was passing no problem, and now we've started seeing it failing, and I want to compare. Or I know that these changes went in uh, at this particular time, so I want to find that and then compare. So we have the ability to do that. We also, of course, mentioned already that we some test results are better shown or displayed in a graphical way, in particular uh, perf benchmarks. And so we have that ability um, in this test results summary service for any benchmark. As we mentioned, you can add quickly, create a parser for whatever benchmark you want to write, and it's going to display it graphically in a number of ways, and it has a live graph, so you could click in, hover over, see what changes went in to a particular thing. So if there was a spike, you could actually reference the changes that went into the SDK that may or may not have caused it. You can also click and take you to the job that actually was maybe the spike in the, in the graph. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we, we're talking about what are the ways that we're dealing with verification overload in o Adopt OpenJDK, in Eclipse OpenJ9, in Eclipse OMR, in our open projects, and even in our internal projects. Um, categorizing, standardizing, minimizing, personalizing, aggregating, summarizing, filtering, sorting, comparing, searching, diffing, visualizing. There's got to be some other verbs I can throw in there. <laughs> well, in fact, yes. So, uh, Lan mentioned, we're also looking at, we don't want to just sit on our laurels here on this open project. 
here's a bunch of Java tests. Now you've got your tests. Don't worry about it. And they go stale and stagnate. Not cool. Um, what we actually want to do is create a center of excellence for testing at the Adopt Open JDK project. And in fact, what we're calling it is the Adopt Open JDK Quality Assurance uh, Plan, Aqua. Um, one of the things that we're going to do as part of that effort is look at various different ways, new technologies, new solutions, any way that we can test better, test smarter, we're going to try it out, we're going to experiment. So I'm not going to go into long detail about what is deep learning. Who here in the room has played around with some sort of AI machine learning? Okay, yeah, cool. Um, so we're, as a team, learning about it. And we're doing some initial rather naive experiments with some of the tools. So I'm just going to quickly talk about that. And when I say naive and simple, I really do mean that because we need to learn how to use TensorFlow. We need to learn about sequential models. We need to know all of this. So we figured the best way to do that is to take a really simple example. And so in this case, we're looking at test output and we're trying to determine if, um, if we can have a model tell us if it passed or failed. So what we're, the, the initial uh, experiment was taking a look at different keywords in the test output and um, producing a model, a uh, sequential model, and figuring out can this thing that we built actually do a proper job of predicting. Now you'll say, why do you care? You actually already know if it passed or failed. We sort of do, but there's a thing called uh, false positives and there's a, a thing like that that maybe we don't always know. And we're not looking at every uh, of the test output of all 87 million tests, so this could be useful as well. We don't actually think it will be useful, this exact experiment, but we're using it as a learning tool. So in this case, uh, we've taken a look at just a small sample set of data. We have uh, the training set, we have then the test data, and we're finding that, oh, that's kind of neat. It actually isn't wildly random. It's actually telling us something. But it's not just keywords in the test output that actually help us, right? When we're thinking about how we triage tests, we're actually thinking, what is captured in our brains as humans that when we look at test output or we look at all of the output from things, how do we make a determination on what's the next action to take, right? Um, we know that we have a list of the variants used, the JVM options, and in fact, it's quite interesting if you look in a core file and you say, oh, uh, of all these core files where things crashed, what's the most common combination of inputs? Does that tell me anything? As a human, that might be really hard for me to determine any pattern, but maybe that's something interesting. Failure expression, how did the test fail? Did it crash horribly? Did it um, just throw an exception? Did it just behave in a different or strange way? Did it just, it passed, but took a lot of time to run compared to other times it ran? Failure age, uh, how long ago did it fail? This also relates to that pull request list, so what changes came in in the space of time between when the thing started failing and when it didn't. The SHAs, so not just of the test material, but also of the SDK or the JDK that we're testing. We mentioned version, impl, platform, that's all good information. Bug prediction scores, so we kind of hinted at it earlier. It's just one of the various metrics that we can use. So that's based on research that actually tells you um, if, I, if I want to predict where defects live in code, I can actually look at how often a source file was changed because of other defects. So <laughs> the likelihood of more defects being found in code that was changed often because of defects is very high. So it's a very inexpensive way of predicting where defects live. So we could use those scores as well as input. And then there's a whole whack of information about the actual hardware we're running on. When was it last refreshed? Um, what changed on it recently? The age of it, I call it, just because it might tell us something about why did something change. 
So as you can see, you feed some of that input into a model, magic happens, blah, blah, blah. You get out to this output of the model. <laughs> That's uh, kind of glossing over it, isn't it? <laughs> but um, you can actually then say, well, what do I want to know? What do I actually want to learn? Uh, I might just want help categorizing the defect. Was it actually an infrastructure problem? Was it actually a test problem? Or was it a serious bug in the actual JDK that we want to find? Um, maybe I want the model to tell me what's my next be best action to take. Or maybe I want to design something that's going to help me rate the value of the test. All of this is quite possible. Um, so the plans forward at the project. This slide is not big enough. <laughs> so I, we haven't listed everything here. Um, but essentially, you know, we aren't doing our jobs well if we keep just bloating and adding tests. As, as Lance said, the more tests doesn't mean better, necessarily. We want to be able to test smarter. So actually, what I want to do is be able to increase functional coverage without adding or t execution time or more tests to the, to the system. Can we do that? Well, actually, we have done that internally uh, at IBM. We had a change-based testing system in place. And now that we've open sourced all of our projects, um, we want to bring that tool out into the open as well. And it's actually in a, at a very good time because o Open JDK project is going to start using the Adopt Open JDK infrastructure for pull request testing. So it'll be quite nice for us to be able to apply a change-based testing thing, looking at the changes that happened in the in the OpenJDK code and saying, actually, this set of tests is appropriate for you to run. You could then add extra stuff if you want to be, you know, uh, extra cautious. But this is the these are the set of tests we feel would cover it. Um, and then, of course, the bug prediction service. Really, um, we had this running uh, when we were uh, hosting code in a different repo or a different type of repo. Now we're in Git. There is a working model of this based off of the white paper uh, that came out of some folks from Google, actually. But we, uh, we have a pretty view on it. So uh, you'll be able to point this service at any Git repo. Uh, and it's going to take a look at everything that changed and everything that was related to an issue and score the files in that repo. So the higher number means the more likelihood there's going to be defects in that file. Uh, and what does that help us with besides maybe feeding it into a model as input? It also might just, if you look at it manually, help us say, mm, actually, we better put some more testing against this particular functionality. Uh, and then, of course, we do want to enhance the tool uh, test result summary service with some analytics. So um, I know we have some of that in plan. We actually have a tool uh, that looks at core files and extracts all of the information out of that and visually represents it. But w uh, on top of that, as we mentioned, you, know, you can look at, for example, the JVM options. I can look at it, but what does that help me? Unless a service that we write, anything we're writing, should actually help guide a person to do some next action. Because if it's just there to look pretty, it's not really that useful. Like, it makes a good slide, I guess, but it, it won't help us at the project. It won't help developers. It won't help people uh, get better quality binaries from Adopt OpenJDK. So everything we do, we want to make sure has a real purpose. And of course, we want to build skills in the team. We want more people to join us and build skills in the team. So if you're interested in learning more about Java, I will say one of the best ways to learn about Java is to test Java. Um, but additionally, if you're interested in any of the stuff we've been talking about, um, some of the deep learning, some of the um, analytics, some of this change-based testing, or any of this other stuff, uh, you probably want to join us at the project. <laughs> Uh, we also have uh, the, the wish to collaborate with research teams. We have a few collaborations underway, one that just launched uh, within the last month. So this is AI-driven fuzz testing for testing compilers, and that's with Professor Leather at the University of Edinburgh. 
We also have a test generation service that we've prototyped, which can look at Java code, look at the signature, and actually generate a, a test with uh, combinatorial test design inputs. So the idea there is actually, I want the minimal number of tests with, that's giving me the most functional coverage. So combinatorial test design is an approach that lets us do that with the notion that if I'm looking at uh, how, how people write Java code, the most common thing is that, well, what they say is a defect in code, it doesn't have to be Java, a defect in code might see it based on one parameter into that method. But very likely, most defects, based on research that they've looked at a lot, a lot of code to find this out, around, on average, 87% of defects can be found by varying two of the inputs to a method, so two-way testing. If you want to be bumping that number up higher than 87%, increasing your odds of catching a defect, you go three-way, but it doesn't get much better than 87. It bumps up to 89 and that kind of stuff. So we can apply that to actual Java code and see where we get. Um, and that wouldn't just work for JDK code. That could work for your Java applications as well. So some of the stuff we're talking about today can be used widely. We've tried to make it generic enough that anyone could benefit from it. So if you have an interest in any of it, let us know. Finally, uh, we want to leverage and deploy any useful models that we have. Hmm. So where do you find us? <laughs> <laughs> These are some of the projects. These are uh, Twitter, Twitter feeds. These are blog posts. There's a lot of great content uh, at those blogs for learning about stuff. Um, I really encourage you to go look and see what's happening here. It's pretty exciting. And finally, I guess to, to contact Lan or myself, um, you can find us there. More importantly, I'd like people to come and play around in the Adopt OpenJDK and Eclipse OpenJ9 projects, learning about Java, learning about how we're testing Java, building Java, how we're delivering it. Um, because that really, I hope, to be a, a community effort, truly. Uh, my wish is actually to bring all of the best minds together in one spot. No one ever invests in testing, so why are we doing testing over here in this silo or in this company and this company? Let's bring our resources together, work as a community to bring the best high quality JDK binaries to the world. So that's kind of our slightly ambitious goal, <laughs> but I, I, I hope you'll join us there. Um, and I probably think I've talked too much. <laughs> right up, huh? We have like two minutes left, so if you have questions, <laughs> fire away. But also, you can just find us out in the hallway, uh, interact with us. We'll show you some more cool stuff if you want uh, on laptops outside. Um, so did anyone else have questions right now? Yeah, OK. I'll s s there. Oh, hello. I'll take a knee. Thank you for the presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, so you have a model. Uh, what, what are the ways to predict maybe test and code quality, like flaky, flaky text? Do you like uh, store this into a database so you can see how the test or piece of code quality changed over time, for example? Yeah. So th I guess your question really is about what features do we need to look at to be able to come to a particular output from a model, right? So oh, yeah. Well, well, I was actually asking if you're doing something different than the model. Uh, yeah, so that model was just, the model I showed in the diagram is just an example of a whack of inputs we happen to have and maybe some things we want to know. This isn't an actual model that we're using for the example previously. Yeah, it's in your yeah. future roadmap. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, what this was meant to show really is when I think about, or if I even talk to a JDK developer, and they look at test output, and they see actually a little piece of, uh, I don't know, um, some prefix on something that came out of a test, or they look at a, bit, a piece of hexadecimal stuff that ended up in some of the output, they look at that and they go, oh yeah, that's the JIT, and that's particularly this. So how did they get there, right? So 
deep learning, machine learning is kind of the same thing. We actually have to recognize and identify what are the pieces of information that we know and use as humans to determine how we take our next step, how we triage. And then, I mean, obviously in here, what that is is uh, weighting the different inputs to say, actually, this doesn't really matter much at all, this particular input, so it doesn't have a very big weight, but this other thing is really important. And those weights and all of that would change depending on what you're trying to determine. Yeah, but I guess the point is this is just to demonstrate that we kind of recognize when we look, if someone has been testing Java for a while, you can quickly look and determine, oh, test problem, or oh, machine problem, and you can quickly make those decisions. Um, it becomes probably harder when you're trying to make a few other decisions. Um, but anyway, I don't know if I answered your question, but I can talk to you after and show you some of the other stuff we have. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Is there thank other you. questions? Yeah. I don't know. I think we're flashing zeros, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, everyone. <laughs>